Hello, everyone. I am Nicole Wingate, speech language pathologist. And I'm Angie Sheets, an intense interventions teacher. And welcome to our presentation of All That in a Bag of Chips. Today we are going to talk about utilizing AAC core and fringe vocabulary and tying that to academic standards. So we're going to cook up a menu for success, and our key ingredients for that, we're going to look at some foundations, building on content connectors or all those alternative standards, linking core and fringe vocabulary to those content connectors, lesson plan examples, curriculum to support the content connectors, planning, storage, and organization. So let's take a look at those foundations. We have presumed competence, universal design for learning, and core vocabulary. When we talk about presuming competence, uh, we need to look at that all people have different talents and skills. Intelligence is a multifaceted and difficult to accurately measure. And children learn best when they are valued, taught, supported, and held to high expectations. And sometimes when we look at those um, students who have more intense needs, uh, we need to assume that maybe just a sound they are making could be a correct answer, um, praising them when they are reacting to a specific question uh, that we're giving them. So when we look at intelligence, it's not a one-dimensional construct, nor it can be um, measured accurately and reliably enough to base students' educational programs and future goals on test results. Sometimes we get psych reports, and they say that the student's at a 24-month-old level, or they were not able to um, accurately get results. And so if we would just take that at face value and look at that report and go ahead and start um, where we think they are, then I, I don't think we're giving that, we're presuming that competence. Um, I've obviously have done this in the past. I have not presumed competence with my students. And now that I have changed my way of thinking uh, over the past few years, the students that we have um, been utilizing AAC and core vocabulary and fringe, they have just blown it out of the water. Um, so I, I've definitely changed the way I'm thinking and presumed competence with all of my students. Uh, children do learn best when they're valued and when people hold high expectations for them and when they're taught and supported well. So I've also found just having that relationship with them um, and establishing that rapport and having those high expectations and thinking, yes, you can do this and we are going to do this and it has been amazing. So that takes us to universal design for learning, and it's uh, a scientifically valid framework for guiding educational practice that provides multiple means of engagement, representation, and expression. And if you look here um, at the picture, it says, you know, could you please shovel the ramp? And all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them, then I'll clear the ramp for you. But if he would have just cleared the ramp, then everyone would have had a path uh, to get up this, get through the snow. So the goal is to produce expect, expert learners who are purposeful and motivated, resourceful and knowledgeable, and strategic and goal-directed. Universal design for learning provides flexibility in ways information is presented and the way students respond or demonstrate knowledge and skills and the way students are engaged. It reduces the barriers in instruction, provides appropriate accommodations, supports, and challenges, and maintains high achievement expectations for all students, including those with disabilities, as well as students who are uh, limited English proficiency. So when we look at equality versus equity, um, and, and we've talked about this with our gen ed teachers, you know, we just can't expect our students to adjust to the curriculum. We have to think about um, how we can change those barriers for our students. So as you can see on the left-hand side, you know, we're giving each student the same size box, but it still doesn't give that, 
short little guy over there on the right access to watch the baseball game. But if we look at that equity piece and giving students what they need, then everybody has access to, look, to watch that game. So now we're going to get into some of those, the core vocabulary. So 84% 84, 84 of core words are actually dolch words. So it really does make a balanced meal if you teach vocabulary, word recognition, fluency, comprehension, and writing using those same words. So you can see in the pictures here how we've taken just those sight words and core words and have given our students um, a multimodal approach to to learning those words. I've been diving into some research here about AAC and the literacy development. And recently I read an article from Jane Farrell, and she states that um, symbol supported text. So when we're working with our students who are using AAC pieces that have a symbolic approach and pairing it with those the written word, there's actually been some discrepancy there. Um, sometimes the symbol can actually increase the confusion for a student when it's used to re represent a word that has multiple meanings, and a symbol can direct <coughs> excuse me, a reader to incorrectly interpret a word using one of its alternative meanings, and thereby preventing the reader from gaining comprehension. So she's basically saying that if we are directly pairing an icon that's a representation of a word on an AAC device with a written word, that sometimes we are actually jumbling up the process. Um, <coughs> In addition, some words don't have an obvious representation, like the word the, T-H-E, is sometimes represented by a graphic symbol that's possibly even more abstract than the word itself. Uh, so at least at that point, the student would get to see the, T-H-E, repeatedly in lots of different environments, which gives them a greater chance to not only learn the word in and of itself, the letter composition, but is also able to learn how it is used. Lots of people also know that the word the, T-H-E, means something, and that symbol representation, T-H-E, will only be seen in limited places. So that kind of limits the exposure of what the student is going to get in the text if it's only paired with the pictures. So just a caution to make sure that we are not making our students prompt reliant on that picture, but also giving them um, equal or greater access and representation to the actual written word so they're truly getting an exposure to the literature piece there. And when we look at um, motor planning, if we're teaching a student the motor plan on the device for the word, it's, it's okay to pair that up with the word. But then when you're um, going into teaching more reading in the literature piece, then fade that uh, symbol out of there. All right, now we're getting down to the nitty gritty. Uh, building on those content connectors. In Indiana, they're called content connectors, and I'm assuming other states are called alternative um, standards. Uh, but there are the pieces, that's the meat out of the state standards that the state is assuming is going to be more appropriate for our students who have multiple challenges and complex medical needs that might cause difficulty to gain the equity that we had discussed. So in our state in Indiana, we have a team called Project Success, and this is our state support network for implementation of those alternative standards. And Project Success comes to our schools and tries to help guide us through this process to decipher what are these standards and these content connectors really asking for, what are those key components to, um, to really get those pieces implemented and get our students rolling with these academic content connectors. So when this team first came to our school, I honestly was like, you want me to do what? Um, I totally had to reframe my thinking and my experiences to meet the needs of my students. I'm an old school teacher, and I've taught life skills for years and years and years and those functional skills pieces. And now I'm really being challenged to dive into those more explicit academic pieces. And it really has been a challenge, but it's been an amazing challenge. It's been a beneficial challenge. It's been an exciting challenge. Um, through Project Success, we develop what's called a tiered system, Tier 1 being our most basic level, Tier 2 is an inter intermediate level, and Tier 3 is a more complex level. That Tier 3 almost mirrors direct state standards. So the Project Success team helps us develop that tier system to help even out the skill levels, still based around the same end goal, the learning standard. And I believe the next step that we went to after tiering, tiering our content connectors was super critical. This is to get the buy-in from the rest of our staff. We divided those critical content connectors into quarters 
for grade for our grade level periods, <clears throat> and we tried to align those standards across the grade bands so that it could be possible to teach a multi-grade class and still follow the same content connector. So in my classroom, I actually have students in grades kindergarten through fourth grade, and oftentimes we are doing a reading group together to get the big idea, and then we break off into smaller groups to be, to receive more personalized instruction. But when we were working on this together as a, um, as a professional group, trying to line up those tiers, you can see all the post-it notes and multicolors spread out across the table. We were lining them up so it could be possible to teach multi-grade levels with the sequential standards, with the tier system, and making it a manageable approach. <clears throat> So I got this nifty little uh, year-long planning guide off of Teachers Pay Teachers. It's completely free. And I love the color-coded piece. And I started breaking it down into those quarters. Like I said, it became much more manageable. When I looked at the large maps that the state produced, I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many things new that I have to teach that I've never taught before, or so many new pieces that I haven't ever approached or even thought about, and I don't have materials to go with it, which are all true statements. Uh, but once I started breaking it down to, okay, I can teach six standards in quarter one. I'm going to teach more than that. But as long as I know that that's my base, that's what I'm held accountable for quarter one, and seven or eight for quarter two, it made it a much more, like I said, manageable task. It did not seem quite so overwhelming. And if it wasn't as overwhelming for me, it made me be more compelling when I was trying to get everybody else on my team to do the same. So whatever your alternative standards are, I totally recommend making your roadmap step-by-step -step process so that it doesn't freak everybody out as you're moving on down the road. <clears throat> So as we, are, we call it the unpacking process in Indiana, and this is um, a template that our state uses, and there's a link to access this, we start out with that content connector, that alternative standard. And then we start looking at those embedded skills. What do we need the student to do, and what do we need the student to know? And so looking at those two main pieces helps us realize what are those stepping stones, what are those building blocks. And that's how we were able to base our kind of our scope and sequence, basically, for how we were going to attack these these state standards that seem daunting and overwhelming. But once again, this template just kind of helped to break it down for us so we could develop that step-by-step -step process. All right, so moving on to another template here. From the year-long planning guide, the one with all the colors on it, I created my own map for my classroom. So we went from big picture to smaller picture to an even smaller picture. And this is where I really got to personalize those pieces, put into play those, those tasks and those activities and those games and those, those pieces of literature that I just I love, that I know are going to be engaging to my students, that I know my staff already knows how to implement to try and ease the stress on this whole process. Um, this piece, too, is where I start listening, listing those content connectors. I go through my calendar and I plot it out. I use that year-long planning guide, and I start matching up the pieces that I have. This also allows me to not only sort out the pieces that I have in place, but I also see where those gaps are. Where do I need to start scavenging for more content? Where do I need to start looking for more resources? What areas do I need to start educating myself about? And then I also share this out. This goes to our S this goes to our OT, this goes to our PT, because I'm our team leader and I expect all those related staff to help me out. I need their resources, I need their expertise because we're all in it together. So this is a great sharing template to say, hey everybody, jump on board. The smaller picture on the right, this is the poster that we get from our state. And it lists everything out, all the content connectors. And so I went through and marked. I laminate them, I keep it by my desk, and when we've hit a content connector, I check it off the list. When I say, whoa, we touched on these, but we really need to go back, we are not close to mastery, I highlight this group, and I say, okay, when we get a chance, these are the days, these are the content connectors that we need to go back to on uh, when we have that time to spend on some extra review pieces here. This also really helped out when I was being observed by my administrators. When they come and sit at my desk when I'm leading a class, and they see right next to my desk is, ooh, there's those content connectors. She really is following the rules and doing what she's supposed to do. So by sharing, <coughs> excuse me, by sharing this out, um, Nicole, our SLP, has been able to really help develop that in our speech and language groups as well. So she supports the main lessons that we're doing in the classroom. If she's doing pull-out services, she is also supporting that main lesson in our classroom and helping develop those skills across environments. So we would um, do a core vocabulary 
word of the week. And so that was mainly like our year one. We would hit core vocabulary hard. And then year two is when we started adding some core and fringe. Um, and when we taught the core vocabulary, we would do word of the week videos. And um, you may have seen those before. They're on YouTube. So I was like, okay, how can we incorporate still word of the week videos, but also um, just looking at the, the core and the fringe and the academic vocabulary. So we're going to show you a quick video. Um, and this goes along with September, week two. So Andrew is working on the life cycle of the butterfly, patterning, um, caterpillar. So of course I chose the hungry caterpillar. Welcome to a special edition of the Word of the Week. We are reviewing the words big, little, eat, and look. So I love this map because I can go in every week and be like, okay, what is she targeting in the classroom? If I'm not pushing into her classroom and I'm pulling out, how can I correlate my lessons to go along with what she's teaching them in the classroom? And so it's been highly beneficial for us to share out this map and really uh, look at those alternative standards with our students. This is totally a work in progress, but it's my starting point, and I'll never get anywhere if I don't start somewhere. So I've shared this with my team so they can also contribute their ideas and their resources. So this is kind of my growing point. I've been dumping in as I go along each year and adding more online resources and pieces that I can easily pull from. So I kind of have a stash each year as I'm going through and implementing those content connectors that I have a variety of pieces and a variety of tools that I can, I can grab on the go. So I share everything out to the Google Drive or a Google Doc um, to make sure that everybody has access and that everybody um, knows where to find everything. The Google Drive is also just an easy way for storage uh, and <clears throat> it's just ease the accessibility piece for all of our staff. So these are the content connector checkoff sheets that we've used. It's kind of like a, maybe a report card. We do still have other report cards as well. But this is just a document for student achievement. It clearly communicates the achievement and it helps to drive instruction as well. So on the left-hand side on the turquoise collar there, it lists our state standard or our content connector. And I've also broken it down into the tiers. And then on the right-hand side, I have the option of circling yes or no for was tier one mastered, was tier two mastered, was tier three mastered. So <clears throat> When we are looking at passing students from grade level to grade level, teacher to teacher, it kind of gives you that starting point, that instructional starting point to know where to begin. Uh, in our state, we have the I-STAR, it's our alternative assessment. So when we are first starting this, we could base that starting point off of I-STAR scores, depending on how much weight you put into a one-time standardized assessment. Uh, however, if you have students who were tested, you can, like I said, go off of those pieces or just use your teacher gut to get a good starting point. This is also a realistic perspective to give to parents to let them see which standards were mastered, which were at a tier one introductory level, where are those gaps that may be occurring, and where are those strengths. 
this is a really nice tool to pass along, like I mentioned, to teacher to teacher or grade level to grade level or school to school as students are transitioning. So this has also helped me to kind of keep, I also keep a, a, a photo file and a video file of some of our students. So this first video is, is a first time student reading his sight words with his AAC device. Nope, that's the second one. So you can see he was just reading words in isolation, which not just because that's a huge success. Uh, but I did follow the content connectors. I did follow the curriculum map and the implementation process. And the next video is the same young man several months later towards the end of the school year. Get. A. So being faithful to the plan really did help this student progress to near grade level for his reading, which was so exciting. When he came in, it was still he pretty much request for his reinforcer was basically what he was doing. So being able to access his AAC device mm -hmm. for academic instruction and demonstrate that competency was remarkable. And these guiding documents really helped to pave the way and hold us accountable for that progress that we expect of our students. And in that first video, I must say, if Angie looked a little funny, yes, she was dressed up like a clown. That was during our carnival. So she was at the ticket booth, and our students had to go through, and they had to do one of their um, working on their IEP goals. And so in order to gain tickets, then to go play in the carnival games. So it was loud. There were several people in there. There were games going on. But yet we're still working towards those contact connectors and IEP goals. So this brings up a quote again, and I'm sure that you've heard me say this before, but I love this quote. Similar to how we must first learn to read before we can read to learn, we must also first learn to communicate before we can communicate to learn. Well, uh, this was by Gail Van Tatenhoff, speech language pathologist. But like Angie said, that tier one of those content connectors, uh, those alternative standards, is that um, that beginning level of communication. And so if we don't give our students um, the ability to communicate, then how are they going to have access to their curriculum? How are they going to communicate to learn? So uh, really building on that tier one uh, level of communication is so crucial and important. And that's why making sure you're sharing your maps out so that our related services and our SLPs, they realize what our end goal as educators is, and so that they can help support us with their expertise and their knowledge. And they, they're able to get their hands on tools that maybe as educators we don't always have the access to. Um, so that team approach is critical. So drawing off those content connectors and incorporating those evidence-based practices, we have to submit some kind of lesson plan formula. Um, so this can be a little crazy and tricky and knowing how to individualize the student's needs. So our State Service Center for Assistive Technology, Patents, created this awesome Universal Design for Learning online lesson creator. So you can go on, you can fill in the blanks, and then they automatically create the lesson plan and send it to your inbox. So this can take a lot, quite a bit of time to create the first go around, um, about 45 minutes. 
But after you kind of get the hang of it, you can copy and paste many of the sections and still come out with a structured yet individualized lesson plan based off of the Universal Design for Learning principles. So you can find that uh, web or that lesson plan on the Patents website, and um, it's free for anybody to use. It's pretty exciting. So here, um, like I said before, we have taught core vocabulary, word of the week, uh, but then we've also gone back and done review lessons every so many weeks and trying to uh, go back and see if they have maintained what they have learned. And so we've done some circuit review. So you can see there are several different core words that we're targeting. And then basically set up in Angie's room, we set up stations. And each person's responsible for a specific station, um, the core word, and then the activity that we're going to do and the supplies that we're going to um, need. And this is awesome. Um, it's usually about six to seven minute sessions jam-packed and then the students rotate through. Uh, so it is kind of a, during our core lesson or our core review, a little bit of a skill and drill uh, type of situation. Um, but it's just essential. Uh, I think our students, they, they uh, are motivated. You know, they're not able to sit usually and sit there for a lesson review for 30, 40 minutes, but if we break it up into short bursts, uh, then it's fun, it's quick, it's a quick way to incorporate the vocabulary and the academic instruction, um, and then also working on those transition pieces with our students, because a lot of times our students have difficulty transitioning. So as you can see, like each staff member is color-coded, but we have those hanging from the ceiling or the color on the tables so that the students know where they're supposed to be going next. And the link that's listed on this slide goes to a it goes to a blog, but it gives you the step by step process and all of the materials that you would need to implement. We call it circuit training um, <laughs> because at that point in time, I was going to the curves exercise center, and it was like these circuits, and you you exercise for six minutes at one station and move to the next one. So in my teacher brain, I'm thinking, okay, if this is supposed to help you get healthy, why couldn't it help you gain new academic skills as well? So six minutes and we move, six minutes and you move, six minutes and you move. But once again, the important key to implementation here is sharing it out with your staff so they know what's the target, what supplies do we need, and what's the end game plan. As you can see, so I'm just going to point out some of these names here, but you know, Angie's our uh, intense intervention teacher, Nicole, myself, the SLP, Laura was our OT, Sarah, our preschool teacher, and then Tiffany is an instructional assistant. So we really do have a team approach when we're doing those circuit reviews because uh, Laura, our OT, can work on those OT pieces during that time as well. So. And it's loud. Yeah. It gets loud and crazy. But I also know when we are doing this, that time of the week, everybody is engaged for that hour. I mean, because oftentimes it's not the case, to be quite honest. It's, it's difficult to get everybody engaged. But circuit training time, I know everybody is there. Everybody's locked in. So moving on and linking that core and fringe to the content connectors, um, giving our students that robust vocabulary. Like I said, year one, we hit core vocabulary hard, and then we started really diving into those content connectors and how we can build that language and build their access to curriculum. So you can see we have a variety of ways here. Um, we have a little author's chair, and they're able to write, like, I like rice and ketchup. Um, but she also did that on her device, looking at the shape. And she really does like rice yeah, and she ketchup. Does. She really loves ketchup. Um, but then also, too, just um, utilizing, like, the colors in the triangles um, or the shapes. And then this was a, a cute one. It really does say poop on the toilet, and really the student did say that. But um, And we were really excited. <laughs> Because he had not done that before, and they were asking him if he was done, you know, are you done? And then he put poop on the toilet on his device, and this is the kiddo that came in pretty much just requesting for his reinforcer. So, yes, we were super excited that he said poop on the toilet. So, Enough that we took a picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> but it just shows you how much his language expanded, as well as just that communicative intent, that back and forth communication, like I can say something to someone and they're going to say something back to me. That's been huge as well. I also think that um, enhancing that flavor, adding that fringe vocabulary, these content connectors 
are tough. These alternative standards are tough. And making sure that our students have access to enough words so that they can be active participants is what's going to make it successful. So here is um, just a list. This is from Core City. So there are tons of different resources out there that have core vocabulary target books available for free or little uh, to no cost. And Toby Dynavox has some. There's some on teachers, paid teachers. Uh, there's some on Language Lab. So there's all kinds, but this is just um, a list from Core City. And these books can be great for practice, but it's also vitally important to target those words through real literature, real books that the students may have on their bookshelves at home real books that their brother and sisters may be reading, real books that they can check out at their local libraries. So if we want to make vocabulary functional, I think we have to bridge that gap between therapeutic instruction to practical real life application. The link on the page I believe takes you to the Core City site where you can download this list of books if you would like. Okay, so we're going to also touch just a little bit here on referential versus descriptive teaching. Uh, a lot of times in schools um, and on tests, teachers are asking for that referential piece. So they're asking for specific facts. They use less frequent vocabulary. They're looking at more of those fringe pieces. Um, it focuses on retrieval skills, and it can also be time consuming. So when we're looking at our students who use an AAC device, uh, the descriptive teaching approach is uh, just gives them more practice in retrieving, combining, and utilizing those core words. So it actually requires them to think deeper, give them creative thinking about concepts, and it is uh, time efficient. I'm going to look at the next slide here. Um, so a science lesson, for example. So a referential question may be, what is this, or what planet is this, Saturn? Well, most students aren't going to have the word Saturn on their devices unless we program that in there. But really, if we look at it, how, how functional is that? How many times in their life are they going to use the word Saturn? But if we ask them, well, tell me about Saturn. It has a big ring. Look at all those core words in there. And those are words that they're going to be using most of the time throughout their life. So using um, terms like, tell me about it, describe this for me, what are the similarities and differences, how and when would you use it? Um, so this, this approach is... Uh, the time efficiency yes. piece has been a big has been a big issue for our classroom because if I'm going to go in and program a word in a student's device, not only do I have to actually sit down and figure out how to program the word in, but then I also have to sit down and teach the child or the student how to access that word, and we have to practice how to access that word before we can actually apply it. Whereas in the descriptive piece, if I go at it in a descriptive approach. They're already using words that's programmed into the device. So I do not have to sit down and figure out how to reprogram again. They're already using words that they know that they have access to. So I don't have to reteach or, or teach to begin with a, a method or a mode to gain access to the vocabulary. Um, and it's also words that I already know how to model, and I've practiced modeling in multiple sessions. So that timepiece in the classroom is huge. It's really a shift in thinking when you're thinking about how you're questioning your students. As Nicole mentioned, we are classic. Teachers are classic for how many, how much, how far. Um, but we need to be reframing our thinking. And I actually sit down and write out those questions that are going to allow my students to be able to use the words that they have uh, frequent access to and knowledge and practice with. But once you get down that bridge and you cross that bridge and start thinking in that manner, it really makes a lot more sense for your classroom for the practical application. I will say, though, there are some times when it is appropriate to program those words, especially if your student has an obsession or, or a strong interest in a specific area, and they're going to be using those, those, yeah. those words more intensely. That would make more sense in that situation. So this also brings us to another tool. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Expanding Expression Tool uh, by Sarah Smith. She's the creator of the Expanding Expression Tool. And I have utilized this so much just in speech therapy se sessions alone. Also done some PD out to our general education teachers so they can utilize it in their classroom to help with um, more descriptive writing as well. Uh, I find I don't know, I'm going to say nowadays. Does that date me when I say nowadays? But 
um, from when I started many years ago, I feel like students are coming in with a less robust vocabulary, not just our, our nonverbal students, but our students in general. Um, and I won't get on that soapbox, but, um, but I love this tool. And we have been able to utilize that with our students who use AAC devices in teaching vocabulary and teaching those uh, descriptive terms. So this is a what, you know, it belongs to what group, what do we do with it, what does it look like, what's it made of, what are its parts, um, where can you find it, what else can you tell me about it. So it has really helped increase their, their vocabulary. So the links you have at the bottom there, one is to a YouTube video utilizing the EET tool, and the other is just to the Expanding Expression site. I have used this model uh, in, and combined it with a circuit training approach. And so each station that the student went to, they were describing pumpkins and utilizing it for a fall themed circuit training system, and it worked really well. And here <laughs> um, is our website. Uh, link to our school website uh, with our Wings Works, and Wings Works is a whole other story on how that got started. But we do have some evidence-based practices on here that we utilize with our students, such as the video modeling, core vocabulary, uh, visual supports. So um, everyone has access to it, school personnel, parents, everyone. So we just want others to to. Yeah, what we're doing is not a big secret. Yes, no. We just want others to support us and carry over and carry through, and we have to give them access to the right tools and supports. So we're sharing access with you. So yes. the link is to our site, and feel free to dive in there. We love feedback. Absolutely. So, we keep adding more things to it as well. All right, so let's dive into some curriculum pieces. Uh, the link on the first page here is to our project success. As I mentioned, that's our state center that supports us as we're driving through those content connectors. And they have a list of free resources or low-cost resources there. So that's the link there. Um, but the amazing piece is that special educators now, we actually have curriculum options. For years, it was just follow your gut, do what you think is right. And now there's actually choices. But now that we have choices, we have to be able to make educated decisions to select the materials that meet our students' needs. So we're going to run through a few of the leading resources, and we are not financially endorsed to promote any of these products. These are some of the products merely that we have that sparked our interest and or that we've had some successful experiences with. All right. So the first one is the Equals Math Kit, and it is a complete curriculum kit. It is jam-packed with materials not only manipulatives, but it also has some assistive tech devices with descriptive means of lessons implementation. So I do have this kit in my classroom, and it was the first full curriculum kit that was ever purchased from my classroom. Prior to that, I had discarded items that I collected from other classrooms, those great garage sale finds, the homemade pieces, and I still use those things too. But this kit truly has everything that you need to get started. The kit is tiered for different levels of learners, and it does have a full scope and sequence of math applications. So I will say when I first opened this box, and I was so excited to actually have it and, get, and have access to all these tools, but it was kind of overwhelming at first, and I had to take it step by step to start breaking down and seeing what I actually needed and what was all in this kit be seriously tons and tons and tons. There is also a members only portal online and it gives you access to other um, video modules and the technology learning lessons, lesson center. So there are smart board uh, or Prometheus board um, options there as well. All right. The first author kit, I've heard great things about this. Uh, it is a Don Johnston product, but I've not gotten to have any hands-on experience with this writing curriculum. Uh, but like I said, rave reviews. So for far too many years, I assumed that if my students couldn't actually write with a pencil due to fine motor compromises, that they couldn't write. And I think the reality was that I didn't know how to teach them to write. And I think I'm still struggling with that, but I'm learning. So in today's day and age, there are far too many pieces of no-tech, low-tech, and high-tech interventions that we just can't let that be the case anymore. We cannot neglect that option for written communication for our students. Now we just have to figure out the right tools to use and the right implementation procedures to go, I'm sorry, to get the ball rolling. And first author may be that tool for some of our students. I have a colleague who has used first author, and she, like I said, raves about it. She actually did a 
an open mic night or an open mic afternoon in her classroom this year where her students sat on a stool, they used the microphone, and they read their writing pieces as their other teachers and their parents came to listen to them share their writing pieces. And it was an awesome event in her classroom. I think part of the first author piece, too, is recognizing, like I mentioned, that there are other means for producing those written responses and just finding those tools and applying them to the writing process. All right, Meville to Weville. I don't know a lot about this curriculum piece, but I was super intrigued to see that it was designed specifically for students with significant disabilities. And it does incorporate the assistive technology also. So this is just evidence. Again, there is no excuse to not be teaching literacy to any student. There, it, there is specifically designed curriculum out there. It's accessing it, it's utilizing it, it's learning it, and it's giving it to our students so that they have every avenue possible to be, to be successful in those attempts. Okay, Edmark program. This is not a literature curriculum, not by any means, but it is a sight word acquisition program, and I do really like it. Um, it focuses mostly on the word identification, the fluency of the vocabulary, and the comprehension of the specified vocabulary. But what I love about this program is that it's very easy to systematically implement with AAC users. And it incorporates a spiral review, which really helps compensate for our students who struggle with long-term memory of the newly acquired skills. Um, it's not fancy or flashy by any means. It's very plain Jane, uh, but it allows for that errorless learning, that positive reinforcement, and it has worked really well in my classroom. I will say I'm a little bit biased, so this was the first reading or language arts piece that I did have access to, so it was the first piece that I learned. But continuously, year after year, it's been a tried and true method to get our students started and gain that confidence that they need to be beginning readers and then build off of that. The reading A to Z, writing A to Z, science A to Z, there's also vocabulary A to Z, I believe. Um, this is an online subscription with available paper downloads or online access, and there's also an iPad version, the RAS for kids, I believe. And it allows you to d download several different levels, uh, 29 levels of reading difficulty. And um, one thing that I liked about reading A to Z was that it gave you that multiple choice quizzes, comprehension quizzes at the end, kind of like um, like accelerated reader tests, which did help prepare my students for when they had to take a standardized test at the state level to be able to go through those procedures, those testing procedures with them, and offer them those multiple choice responses so they could indicate their preference and their choice when going through those, those methods with them. And I will say that the reading materials are fairly interesting too, and they also have a great selection of fiction and nonfiction. The All program, uh, this used to be, it used to come in a hard copy and multiple binders, but now it's available in an app format with a data analysis tool. So anybody who wants to configure my data, I'm happy to give that a whirl. Um, I have not used this extensively. I've just kind of leafed through and used it a little bit with a couple kiddos. But it does include that sound blending and the phoneme, the phoneme segmentation, which I absolutely need help with, uh, the letter sound correspondence, that word decoding pieces there. I, I would encourage to make sure that you are using um, real literature alongside this piece too. All right, the Unique Learning System I know gets lots of great reviews. One thing that when I originally looked at Unique, we I, I started out with AAC using the LAMP system and fell in love with it and certainly had a lot of great success with it. So when I first looked at Unique, I was a little bit put off that it used the Simple 6. But as I grew in my knowledge of AAC, realizing that it's not all about the symbols, um, it helped me get past that a little bit. But I will say that on the AAC Language Lab, it does translate the unique symbols um, into LAMP symbols or Unity symbols too. I also know that they do have free summer downloads, so if you want to give this further exploration, you can sign in to Unique or News to You, and they do have free summer downloads. And it does cover all of the basic academic areas for science and social studies as well as reading and math. Okay, so when we're looking at um, AAC as well as tying that to the content connectors and giving our students access to curriculum, we rely heavily on our instructional assistants. They are really the sugar on top. Um, so we do different professional development 
developments with them, but it's also a lot of hands-on training, modeling for them, letting them know that we're in this together. It's okay if you make a mistake because we're going to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, so we publicly, publicly brag about them when they're doing great things. Our school is big on Twitter, so we'll tweet out pictures of them um, utilizing AAC or working with students um, with their AAC devices and their academic instruction. Uh, when we do give criticism, we always want to make sure that it's very constructive criticism. Uh, openly admit when you make a mistake. And then also, Angie has ran some different classroom contests, so maybe a, a no diaper day. So they'll work towards different classroom prizes um, with uh, gathering AAC data or working in the academic, academic instruction. So this is one of our instructional assistants. And like I said, empower your assistants. And um, Angie's assistants have really They've had a mind shift and they presume confidence and their expectations for the students are as higher, higher than what we do. I mean, they are just fully um, engaged with those students. So you can see one of our instructional assistants here and she is working with some students. But she had this Facebook post um, last September and I'll just quickly read it. It's just so heart heartwarming. Um, so she says, I always wanted to be an RN growing up and work in labor and delivery. Life happens and it throws you a curveball or two sometimes. I've even tried going back since having a family, but I think my heart just wasn't fully in it. I felt like I missed out on too much or that I was going to miss out on too much becoming an RN and working long shifts. Today was another day of evidence that I love what I do. Yes, some days are better than others. Some days I don't know if I washed my hands or if slobber caked on my hands. I catch myself asking, is it time to go home or is it Friday yet? Sometimes our day needs to restart a restart button at 7.55 a.m. And some days seem like a circus in our room, but today was the real circus. But I love what I do. To go to school and see our kiddos thrive and push on even when they have challenging obstacles ahead is so rewarding. The good days outweigh the bad days, and we have an amazing rock star team to keep us going. It's nothing for us to say, let me know if you need a break. Do you need to tap out? It's just what we do. Never would I have thought two years ago I would be doing ABA with kids with autism and then moving on to special education at an awesome school that wholeheartedly puts our students first and has an amazing school community to help support our kiddos. We could not do what we do without the team that we have um, and the assistance that we have. They're amazing. All right, so we've talked a lot about different curriculum options, about making sure your team knows what's happening, about what materials they're going to need. And so now, how do we plan, store, and organize all of this stuff? So, all right, so this is a real picture of my desk. And this looks like a pretty good day because I can still see actual desktop on there. So this is kind of like the I Spy books, you know. And you might be a special ed teacher if you see two diazepam trainers, a uh, writing assignment, uh, two forms of data collection, whatever, a light-up toy, the to-do list. So this is what it really looks like. Um, so how do we get this to be more functional? The storage part. This is how I do it. This is what works for me. My daughter comes in over the summer and helps me. Yes, it does require some personal time, but once you put, once you plan forward, it's going to help so make things go so much more smoothly throughout the year. So the initial process will be a gigantic mess. Papers everywhere, books everywhere, but the finished product will be so helpful and save you hours of prep in the long run. In addition to these physical baskets, so I have a basket for every single week of the school year. I label each basket with a sequential date of implementation along with those content connectors that we're going to target each and every week. So in addition to these physical baskets, I also have digital folders on my computer desktop and a folder for each week of the school year that contains my smart board lessons and um, my, my calendar pieces, anything that I might need to allow for easy access for my assistants and anybody else who might need to jump in if I have a sub that day or if I'm unexpectedly pulled or I'm absent for a, a conference or testing or whatever might take place there. So inside these baskets, I lay out for every single week my lesson plan outlines, my books, my worksheets, my manipulatives, anything that anybody might need to pretty much read my mind and make it pretty simple as to and, and outline it pretty specifically, this is what we're doing for the week. 
So then on Friday afternoons, I pulled down my tote, my basket out of the cabinet, and I started unloading it. I used this hanging rainbow organizer um, to divide up the resources into subject areas for math, reading, vocabulary, science, social studies. The three horizontal rows are used for differentiation of activities for my various grades, needs, and ability levels. So across the top, I have reading for Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, math, Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, science, social studies, and um, vocabulary and health as well. So being able to divide it up helps keep things organized. Everything has a spot, and uh, it's easy to access. So um, don't forget about the garden this year. What about those IEP goals? We've talked a lot about specifically those state standards or the alternative standards, but uh, we also need to make sure that we're targeting keeping at the forefront those IEP goals. So I use learning target posters to make certain that we are not neglecting those IEP goals and we are focusing on the content connectors as well. I keep goal baskets loaded for specific goal time and any breaks that might be good opportunities to spend some time dedicated to goal instruction. And I make sure that those baskets are loaded and we change them out on a weekly basis to make sure that there's fresh materials available so that nobody gets bored with what's happening there. Um, I also use QR codes linked to Google Forms for easy data collection. And a lot of my assistants keep uh, make copies of those QR codes and keep them on their lanyards so that they can easily use their phone or an iPad and scan that and it will be ready to lead them towards that data documentation there. Um, this process has worked so well for us. The data, I've gotten more data doing it this way and giving them access, giving my assistants access to the forms than when I did do checklists and when I did do uh, notebooks. Uh, all of that work probably would have broken my back by now as well as has gotten me out of the profession. Digitizing the forms um, has made the process of data analysis so much more efficient. I no longer feel like I'm dragging home paper after paper after paper and getting my, I used to get my colored pencils out with my graph paper and make my own graphs to analyze my data and now that it's happening digitally, my life is so much easier. So being able to pull the IEP goals together with the data analysis and diving into those content connectors, we've had amazing success for our yes. students. We can't believe the accomplishments they've made and they have gone far beyond what we ever dreamt possible, and now I'm regretful that I had set limits on my students originally, and I will no longer do that. I was very skeptical, skeptical when we started implementing the content connectors, and now I'm a firm believer. Making sure you have the right tools, making sure your students have a means of communication and access to that technology or those low-tech devices to give them a means to participate and to, to be assessed is critical, as well as that team approach to be able to analyze what tools and what curriculum pieces you need, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, the team approach has definitely been amazing. Um, just having, you know, not only the Google Forms, but we have, you know, a special ed Google Drive that's broken down into the core vocabulary, or we have the special ed map with the content connectors, so we can all have access to what everyone's doing. Go in, I can go in, like I said before, and see what Angie's targeting for that next week and plan accordingly. And it not only helps us, but I think that's what has helped our students be successful. So that wraps up our presentation of all that in a bag of chips. So we just want to thank you so much for listening. And it's our goal just to share what we've been doing and hopefully empower others um, so that they can have the same experience um, that we've had. And also we are totally open to new ideas, suggestions, so please reach out to us. Here's our school emails. We also have our Speak Up LLC email on here as well. Uh, we have a link to our Wings Works uh, with our Core Word of the Week videos as well as our school website that goes to our evidence-based practices. So again, we thank you so much. Thank you.